All right, good evening. Welcome and thank you everyone for joining us tonight uh, for a webinar with Alex Main. Thank you for those joining us on Facebook as well. Um, I'll put that share link in the chat in just a minute. If you would help us share that on Facebook, we'd really appreciate that. Um, hi, Kathy. <laughs> Great. So we have the chat open this evening. I see a few people saying hi and introducing themselves. Please feel free to use that chat to communicate with your panelists um, and with other attendees. We have about 73 people on this call right now on Zoom. We have a few more on, on Facebook. Um, so I'll just introduce myself quickly. My name is Elaine Spivak Rodriguez with the Alliance for Global Justice. We are one of the, co -co the coordinators for this uh, webinar series, um, along with Chicago Alba Solidarity, uh, Frente Hugo Chavez para la Defensa de los Pueblos, Vancouver, Task Force on the Americas, Orinoco Tribune, Alberto Lovera, Bolivarian Circle of New York. We do these webinars monthly. Um, and if you ever have any suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover or speakers you'd like us to bring on, please feel free to get in touch. Um, I, uh, a little bit about this call tonight, um, we are gonna do a presentation Alex is gonna to speak to us for about uh, 25, 35 minutes. Um, and then we're gonna to go to Q&A from all of our attendees. So please feel free to use that Q&A icon there in the low, lower part of your screen to submit your questions. I will look for questions in the chat, but if you really want me to see them for sure, make sure to put them in the Q&A. Um, so let's see, I'll go into, let's get started. So our webinar tonight is titled Recent Latin American Elections Repudiate Neoliberal Rule, um, featuring Alex Main. Alex is the Director of International Policy at the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, DC. He monitors economic and political developments in Latin America and the Caribbean. Areas, areas of expertise include Latin America integration, regionalism, uh, U.S. security and counter narcotics policy in, in Central America and U.S. relations with Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Honduras, and Venezuela. Prior to CEPR, Alex spent more than six years in South America working as a foreign policy analyst and an international co uh, cooperation consultant. He holds a degree in history and political science from Sorbonne University in Paris. Alex, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. So uh, first of all, I want to thank um, well Chicago, Chicago Alba Solidarity and the Alliance uh, for Global Justice and the other great groups that are hosting uh, this uh, webinar. It's a real honor. Um, and for those that don't know my organization, um, Center for Economic and Policy Research, or CEPR for short, um, we work on economic issues, obviously, but also a lot of foreign policy issues. And we monitor the uh, sort of politics and economics of Latin America. Um, and many of the things I'm gonna talk about today, we actually have articles and reports on, um, on our webpage, which is at cepr.net, N-E-T. Uh, and I'll try to flag a few of those, but I can't flag them all. Um, but you can find a lot of that in um, sort of the issues section on that website. Uh, and uh, let's get going because we have a lot to cover. Um, there are a lot of big elections uh, in Latin America. There have been um, a few in the last few months and uh, many more in the months ahead. And um, in many cases, they're going to be contributing to some significant political change in those countries and sort of a reconfiguration of, of the region politically. Um, and so we've seen elections recently in Bolivia and Venezuela. We're in the middle of elections right now in Ecuador. Uh, and there are more national elections that are coming up in El Salvador and Peru in Chile, in Mexico, Honduras, uh, Chile again in November. And, uh, and then normally in Haiti, uh, although as many of you probably know, uh, things are uh, quite up in the air and there's a crisis in the moment um, in Haiti, um, precisely around the question of when uh, the elections are gonna be held. Uh, but today I'm just gonna focus on five elections. It's already a lot, it's pretty challenging. Um, 
at, and I want to look at those that look uh, took place last year in Bolivia and Venezuela, and then those that are going to be taking place uh, very soon in Ecuador, Peru, and Chile. So they're very different countries um, with you know very complex political and social realities. Um, but I thought we could try to group them up a little bit. Um, Venezuela, I think, kind of stands on its own, where the salient feature, I think, is really the outside intervention that's occurred around uh, the election there that took place in December. Um, Bolivian, Ecuador, Bolivia and Ecuador, um, really, I think it's uh, kind of about the return of some uh, progressive projects that have been in place for 10 years or more, that were in place for 10 years or more. And in Peru and Chile, we're seeing the possibility of the left um, taking power for the first time in, in many decades, um, uh, though it's still quite uncertain in both of those countries. Uh, and other common themes uh, in these elections, I would say, um, you know, as the title of this webinar suggests, there's a very strong rejection of neoliberalism that we see in these elections. Um, we see uh, in all of these countries um, right-wing media oligo oligopolies that uh, essentially engage in campaigns against left movements. Uh, we're seeing that at the moment in Ecuador, um, where it's very intense. Um, and in a number of these countries, we see the involvement of the Organization of American States, uh, which is, as you, I think, all probably know, is very heavily influenced by the United States. So I thought that after kind of looking over these elections um, far too quickly, uh, we could spend a little bit of time talking uh, as well about the primary external player in the region's politics, which is the US administration, and what um, maybe we can expect from the Biden administration. And then hopefully in the Q&A, um, we can discuss some of the gaps in this analysis and, and benefit from everyone's collective wisdom. Um, so to start off with, um, Venezuela had legislative elections in December. And as you probably know, the, um, the government uh, coalition there won overwhelmingly. The narrative that uh, many of us have seen in uh, the mainstream media and in the State Department is that these elections were fraudulent. Um, in fact, no, there were certainly some issues around various aspects of the organization of these elections, but there is absolutely no evidence of a rigged vote. Uh, what did occur there was a boycott of the elections by much of the opposition, and more precisely a US-backed boycott. Um, and, and that's not the same thing as a fraudulent election, just to be clear. Um, and so as I was saying, um, external intervention was really one of the, the strong features in these elections. And you know, coming primarily from the US, um, although also um, to a certain extent, you know, from the European Union and Canada and, and other uh, governments. So um, I'll focus mostly on the US. Uh, I think kind of the most important thing to highlight is that the country was and still is under siege. Um, it's uh, subjected to an economic war, uh, really quite similar to what uh, Cuba has been subjected to for decades. Um, in the case of Venezuela, there have been sanctions in place since 2015. And since August of 2017, sweeping economic and financial sanctions that have uh, intensified in 2019. Uh, when the U.S. went about um, recognizing Guaido um, as the leader of the country and, and then, you know, trying to basically force the population uh, and the military to go along with that through, through even more sanctions. And, of course, as a result of this, the Venezuelan economy, uh, which was already experiencing, uh, you know, pretty severe difficulties before the sanctions started, um, is, it, you know, really in, in a full-fledged crisis at this point, the sanctions have contributed to the cutting off of, uh, um, and, you know, and the decrease of a lot of vital imports to the country. Um, this has led, you know, to deaths, uh, obviously huge public health issues to um, increased migration from the country. Uh, we've covered some of this in a report um, on our website. Uh, 
co-authored by my colleague Mark Weisbrot and by the economist Jeffrey Sachs. Um, and there are other reports as well on the impact of sanctions, including from Francisco Rodriguez, who is actually from the Venezuelan opposition, but uh, is uh, willing to acknowledge the impact of sanctions on, on the country. And so on top of this, um, you have the US that has been uh, supporting uh, a coup in Venezuela, um, really very overtly since uh, early 2019 when they recognized uh, Juan Guaido made um, really very forceful open calls to the Venezuelan military to rebel against uh, the Maduro government. And this is part of the US's sort of ongoing support for um, really a very intransigent sector of the opposition um, in Venezuela uh, that opposes dialogue, opposes elections, um, and appears to oppose you know, any sort of constitutional way forward uh, to resolving the country's political crisis. This is not the entire opposition at all. This is just a part of the opposition, but often um, in the media, and, and again, in the statements you see from the State Department, when they refer to the opposition, they're referring to this hardline opposition. Um, and that brings me to the boycott issue, which is a tactic that has been frequently promoted by hardline opposition in Venezuela, electoral boycotts, and, and has been supported by the US on at least three occasions. Um, the first time to my recollection was uh, during the 2005 legislative elections, where in the end, uh, you only had 25% of the um, of voters that participated in those elections. Um, then you had uh, the 2018 presidential elections that you often also, also often hear referred to as rigged, though there's no evidence of any kind of vote manipulation. Um, again, there was a boycott there. And then the, these last um, elections in December. Uh, and so in these elections, um, you had some moderate opposition that participated, but by and large, um, the major opposition actors did not. And what was interesting is that at one point um, in the fall, you had um, some major opposition actors, uh, including Enrique Capriles, the former uh, president, or sorry, the former candidate to the presidency of Venezuela, um, and, and also the country's conference of bishops, uh, the Conferencia Episcopal, which, um, believe it or not, is a strong opposition force as well. Uh, they were calling for participation in these elections. And at one point it looked like the EU might even recognize the elections, but um, all of these efforts were very aggressively opposed by the US uh, Trump administration. And um, all of these actors ended up withdrawing their support for uh, the elections. And so the result was you had, again, a very high level of, of abstention, not as high as in 2005, but uh, still uh, you know, a little over 30%. Um, participation. And so, you know, this has really been a problem in Venezuela since the early 2000s, um, where you've had a hardline sector of the opposition that's often supported and promoted by the US that, that basically refuses to play ball um, and whose goal is the regime change at all costs. And, and they've often gotten support from the US. Um, and, you know, it's not that there weren't any issues with these elections. Uh, you know, I really think there were uh, around the selection of the CNE, uh, the electoral authority, for instance, um, the Supreme Court's intervention in the political parties and sort of selecting their leadership. Um, though at the root of all of this, there, there really is an institutional crisis that Venezuela has been experiencing um, since 2015, essentially, that's been stoked by the US and other outside actors. And, and that's often a piece of context that's mis missing. So that, uh, that's for Venezuela. We can get back to Venezuela in the, the Q&A, hopefully. Um, but I wanna turn now to the elections in Bolivia and Ecuador, uh, where in both cases, you know, we're seeing, we, we have seen in Bolivia, we may see in Ecuador, the comeback of a recent uh, sort of left-wing, um, you know, popular projects. So to start with Bolivia, uh, I, think, um, I think the first thing to point out is that these are elections that at 
took place last year, October 2020, um, that really should never have happened. Um, they're the result uh, of a coup that derailed the 2019 elections that um, were never completed um, as a result of, of a coup that was supported um, by a good deal of the opposition uh, of the country and by the police and the military. Um, but the good news is that these latest elections brought back the movement that was undemocratically ousted. It brought, brought them back to power. So um, with the 2019 coup, and this is something we've also looked at a lot, um, uh, we've done various papers, um, articles, and so on, on the false fraud narrative in um, those elections which was really the basis for the coup. It was used as the pretext for the coup. And it was promoted um, by the Organization of American States, uh, which had an uh, observational electoral mission in the country. Uh, they started doing it the day after the election and then they kept doing it after that. And um, this was despite the fact that, that we at CEPR and then a number of other you know, independent experts um, you know, debunked the claims, which were fairly easy to debunk. And I can go into those details later if people are interested. Um, and it took months, but finally you had major outlets like the Washington Post and the New York Times that, you know, contradicted the OAS and the State Department, which supported the OAS and um, in their claims and, uh, you know, published, um, you know, the reports debunking the OAS claims. Um, but, but, but the problem is this happened not in the days following the claims being made, but months after the coup had occurred. Um, so a little bit too late, really. Um, and in the meantime, uh, you know, the opposition carried out violent protests, the police and military forced Evo Morales out of power, and you had a far right, uh, um, really ultra conservative, um, anti-indigenous uh, coup regime that took power. Uh, it um, you know, was involved in massacring indigenous protesters and persecuting leaders from Evo Morales's um, mass uh, movement towards socialism party. And you know, they, they promised new elections from the outset, but they did everything they could to delay them as much as they could until finally there were very large protests and they ended up um, fixing a date. Uh, but you know, the elections took place months after they should have taken place. And, and the result um, was a landslide uh, win, both in the presidential elections and legislative elections for the mass party. Um, and the mass uh, presidential candidate uh, was Evo's finance minister, Luis Arce, responsible for many um, of the very successful economic and social policies under Evo Morales. We have papers on that as well as on our website. And, um, and, and the ticket also included the vice presidential candidate, David Choquehuanca, who had been Evo Morales's foreign minister. So really, you know, their election was a sign of very clear support from the population for the political project that was interrupted by this coup. So that, that's what happened essentially in, in Bolivia and in Ecuador. Ecuador has just had uh, their first round. It was on, on February 6th. And um, Andres Arauz, um, who full disclosure was a senior fellow at my organization until recently, is an excellent economist and, 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 and helped on a number of issues. Um, but uh, he's the candidate for the Revolucion, Revolucion Ciudadana movement. Um, it's a movement that had their party taken away from them, uh, Alianza País. Um, uh, but it's linked, of course, to the former president, Rafael Correa. And Arauz came in first place with a 12 point lead uh, ahead of the runner up, the conservative candidate, Guillermo Lasso. And Arauz um, is now, I would say, in a very strong position to win the April uh, runoff election against uh, Guillermo Lasso, as, as the overall vote, when you look at it, really suggests um, that voters um, are, are, are voting you know, in a progressive manner and against sort of a neo, any sort of neoliberal 
a program like the one uh, that Guillermo Molasso um, supports. So I think these results, uh, you know, a bit like the results that we saw in Bolivia, uh, show the enduring popularity of this um, Revolución Ciudadana project. Um, and Andrés Arauz is quite like Luis Arce in that he played a very central role in developing and implementing a lot of the successful economic and social programs of the 10-year Correa administration, um, which vastly reduced poverty levels and, and uh, you know, improved public access to education and health care. A lot of very innovative policies that uh, Arouse played a big role in and that we analyze in at least two uh, reports on our webpage. The um, Revolución Ciudadana project was also derailed against the will of the people. Um, in this case, uh, the outgoing president, uh, Lenin Moreno, was a Correa ally. He had been elected on a platform of, uh, platform of con continuity with the Correa administration. Um, but then once he got into power, he essentially betrayed the cause and he formed an alliance with uh, the country's economic elites and powerful bankers and rolled back um, many of Korea's um, more progressive policies. And really the final straw for Ecuadorans was Lenin Moreno's um, IMF backed austerity measures. And that led to massive protests in October of 2019 that were led by indigenous movements um, and that were violently repressed by military and police. On top of that, the Moreno government packed the courts um, and has an attorney general who's still in place that engaged in intense um, you know, judicial persecution I would call it, against Rafael Correa and other um, leaders of the movement, which included uh, unfounded charges of corruption, sedition, instigation of violence, and, and many of the leaders were forced into exile, including Rafael Correa. We can maybe go into more detail on that later as well. Um, but uh, more recently, the Moreno administration um, engaged in all kinds of maneuvers to keep um, Andres Arauz off the ballot. Um, they were ultimately unsuccessful and Arauz managed to register his candidacy at the last possible minute in December of last year. Um, and so in the current election, um, it's interesting, we're also seeing um, unsubstantiated claims of fraud and attempts to interfere with the election. Um, you know, with apparently the aim of preventing uh, an Arouse victory in April. We're also seeing external interference coming in this case, mostly from Colombia, uh, of course, a close ally of the US, um, where the attorney general there, who's um, a very close ally of the president, Duque, has been making claims of um, the ELN um, guerrilla uh, forces in um, Colombia, uh, supporting Arauz, uh, again, without any kind of evidence, but Moreno's attorney general is now launching an investigation into these claims. So it's, you know, becoming a big distraction in the election. So that's, those, those are some, some uh, sort of concerning issues there. Um, and now I'll move on um, and finish with Peru and Chile. Um, where you have um, really the left there has been extremely weak for decades. Um, in, in Chile, of course, it was decimated and exiled under the Pinochet dic dictatorship. Um, and, you know, and, then, and in Peru, it was also very violently repressed. And, and um, on top of that, uh, subjected to an intense McCarthyite sort of campaign, which continues to this day, which is to sort of associate anyone on the left with, you know, the former um, guerrilla movement, Sendero Luminoso and the communists and so on. Um, and this is something that you see a lot, uh, you know, in the media in Peru. But in both countries, the left today 
uh, appears to be well positioned to, to make something of a comeback. So in Peru, um, the left has been growing stronger with, um, you have the left-wing candidate there, Ver Veronica Mendoza, the leading uh, candidate on the left, who nearly made it to a runoff election in 2016, where she would um, almost certainly have won against uh, Keiko Fujimori, um, but she, she didn't get in there by less than three points. And, um, it's a country where, you, where really the sort of traditional parties and traditional conservative actors that have ruled for decades have been extremely discredited and for a long time now, but uh, over the last couple of years, even more, um, where you've had a combination of uh, corruption scandals and um, you know, this led to major, major protests in both 2019 and 2020 and also um, led to an enormous amount of political instability with four different presidents in the space of three years, uh, Kaczynski, Vizcarra, Marino, and now Sagasti. And, um, and it, you've also seen a lot of increase in, in inequality and poverty, and, and that's been aggravated a great deal um, in recent months um, during the pandemic. And Peru is one of the countries that's uh, been hit the hardest in Latin America and where the lockdown seems to have been the worst and kind of, um, you know, really making life difficult, uh, impossible really for uh, the poor uh, of the country um, just to carry out their daily lives and to work and so on. Um, so that's sort of the situation. That's the context that you have uh, in Peru along with, you know, now, a long series of, of presidents that have been elected on anti-neoliberal platforms, but that have ended up supporting neoliberal platforms. Um, and you know, right now, when you look at the polls for what they're worth, uh, no candidate is very strong. None seems to have more than 10% in the polls at the moment, um, but um, Veronica Mendoza is among the top candidates for the Juntos por el Perú. Um, together for Peru party. And um, so I think, I think she has a real shot, but it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say. And, and there is, when there is an immediate blackout of Veronica, Veronica Mendoza, there is sort of immediate assault against Veronica Mendoza. So again, we're seeing the role, you know, the political role of the media um, in, in Peru as in other countries. And uh, finally, Chile, which is particularly exciting uh, right now because it's following in the footsteps of other countries that um, you know, rewrote outdated conservative constitutions you know, through participatory sort of processes, um, as was the case in Venezuela and then Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, but in this case, you have a constitution that's particularly outdated and conservative. It was written under the Pinochet dictatorship with no sort of broad pit based input. Um, so it's it, it, a bit like the uh, really the um, the constitution in in Honduras for those that know the history of Honduras a little bit where that was also sort of written in a transitional moment of the, of the end of the dictatorship there. Um, but you know this would not have happened um, this whole process that's now occurring, there are going to be elections in April for a constituent assembly, um, without the very massive, amazing protests in late uh, 2019, um, and that carried over into 2020 that you're surely all aware of, and that essentially forced, um, you know, the right wing president Piñera to hold a referendum on whether or not Chile needs a new constitution and on, on how it should be drafted. And, and the yes um, on that referendum question vote, um, it won by 79.2%. So a huge defeat um, for the right, uh, which had campaigned for the no. <laughs> um, and, and so now you're gonna have a vote on a constituent assembly that's gonna be made up entirely of a fresh set of elected representatives. Um, you, you know, so 
completely independent of the current legislature. So uh, I think, you know, one sort of footnote to add to that is that, um, you know, the more powerful parties in Chile um, succeeded in putting some safeguards into the drafting process uh, to really try to ensure that, you know, radical demands won't end up being enshrined in the constitution. And so, for instance, you have to have a two thirds vote on sort of each each article in the constitution. And that's very difficult to get without, um, you know, bringing in sort of, you know, moderate and right wing de delegates. Um, although we'll have to see what, you know, the next, what the constituent assembly looks like, we, we don't know yet. Um, but still it's, uh, you know, really an enormous sort of popular victory uh, for the Chilean people. So you have those elections in April and then in November, you have general elections. And we're in a context where, you know, the right really seems very weak and discredited. Um, Piñera is, is obviously very unpopular and, you know, in his neoliberal program. And, and, and to a certain extent, center and center left parties are also quite weak because, you know, ever since the end of the dictatorship, the, these parties of the you know, so-called concertación um, really were supportive of, of neoliberal programs and kind of the general neoliberal agenda that came out of the uh, Pinochet dictatorship. But um, on, on the other hand, the left in Chile is extremely divided at the moment. Um, and so in any case, the, the most likely candidate, it looks like from um, the right-wing coalition, and I mean, I think it's kind of a sure bet at this point, is Joaquin Lavin, uh, who's the mayor of, of, of Las Cumbes, and, and you know, appropriately for a, a right-winger in Chile is a Chicago boy, and, and has been very openly supportive of the Pinochet dictatorship. He's written a book about it called The Quiet Revolution. Um, and then um, the candidate for the constituent unity, which is, kind of a, a new version of the concertacion, at least it, it seems to be a bit based on that um, with kind of center and center left um, parties. Uh, I think the candidate that has the best bet, um, it, it looks like it's Paula Narvaez, who's very close to um, Bachelet, sort of a Bachelet protege, um, Bachelet, the former, um, president of Chile. And, and she would have, I think, a pretty good chance of winning if the left-wing parties um, don't succeed in sort of uniting behind a candidate. And, and there, uh, kind of the most obvious candidate at this point is Daniel Hadwe. Um, he's a very popular communist uh, party mayor of uh, Recoleta in Santiago, a municipality within Santiago. Um, and I think really the question of whether he can win or not depends in large part on whether he can sort of manage to forge alliances with other left parties and in particular with the Frente Amplio uh, coalition. So that's it for my summary of the elections. Um, and now I'll try to be very quick on, on the Biden part of this, um, what we might anticipate from the Biden administration um, and particularly in the countries where left-wing uh, parties take power. So it's not really very encouraging. Um, there are a lot of indications that Biden intends to return to the Obama Latin America agenda. I mean, for one, it's, it's nearly the same personnel. Uh, it's the, the same um, you know, team uh, from the Obama White House and State Department that's back to a large extent. Um, and, and, you know, the Obama agenda was certainly a lot less destructive than Trump's agenda, but uh, it, you know, had a lot of unfortunate similarities with Trump's policies. And so what we saw under Obama um, was really the administration exploited just about every opportunity to undermine left governments that it saw as problematic. So it helped, helped the coup in Honduras succeed in 2009, the coup against the, the sort of left-leaning president. Manuel Celaya, and, and then, you know, sort of gave diplomatic support to soft coups in Paraguay and Brazil in 2011 and 2016. And then um, 
engaged in economic warfare. Uh, you know, the obvious case is Venezuela. It's the Obama administration that, that got the sanctions regime going in 2015. Um, but also Argentina. Uh, in Argentina, the U.S. blocked, um, uh, you know, basically all the programs from the uh, international financial institutions or, or attempted to block um, all the loan programs. And, and so that hit Argentina hard at a moment when it was doing, uh, you know, quite badly economically in, you know, around 2000, 2014, 2015. Um, and then uh, the U.S. is also, uh, to an extent, uh, supported some of this judicial persecution um, or lawfare, as a lot of people are calling it, targeting left leaders. And, and the most notable case, I think, is Brazil, where Obama's Department of Justice cooperated quite closely with the very politicized and you know, very unethical um, car wash, anti-corruption operation. Um, so what have we seen from Biden so far? Um, we can hope that his policies won't be a carbon copy of Obama's. Um, but what have we what have we seen so far? And you know, one of the first things that um, leapt to my attention was the fact that um, Biden, as candidate, said nothing about the coup in Bolivia. Um, uh, Bernie Sanders did. Um, Elizabeth Warren ended up uh, speaking out against it as well. Um, nothing from Biden at all. Um, and now, uh, now that Biden is in office. Um, so they're picking up where Trump left off in Venezuela. Uh, so continuing to rec recognize um, uh, the this, this self-declared President Guaido, even though at this point the European Union has you know, finally stopped doing that. Um, and, and of course the US has not removed any of the deadly sanctions that they've been imposing on Venezuela. And on Ecuador, something very ominous happened two days ago, um, which is that the State Department um, sort of promoted this list of anti-corruption champions that they were um, honoring. And the one for Latin America is Diana Salazar. So Diana Salazar is the attorney general of Ecuador um, under Lenin Moreno, who I mentioned earlier, who has been very involved in sort of the lawfare against um, you know, the leaders from the Revolución Ciudadana. Um, and she is currently intervening in, in the elections, uh, seemingly to undermine Andres Arauz um, in, in, in a number of ways. I mean, one, I'd already mentioned that she is taking up this investigation of you know, these supposed links between the ELN um, guerrilla force in Colombia and, and Arauz, despite you know, no evidence. And, um, and, and just recently, she has been trying to conduct uh, an audit of the electronic system of the elections, which makes absolutely no sense, which I can go into later, but that would be extremely disruptive to the elections there, um, you know, and could cause a lot of problems. So uh, it, it's it's very worrying that, um, you know, this is one of the Biden administration's early acts on Latin America to honor this particular individual, um, who's you know uh, engaged in um, you know real political persecution at this point. And, and also it speaks to sort of the broader problem, I think, of the Biden anti-corruption agenda, which, you know, granted it can be good in some places. The, the US has pr provided support in the past to the CCIG, um, the UN sponsored anti-corruption, um, anti-organized crime mission in Guatemala, which has had a lot of issues, but you know, it's had some relative successes. Um, but, but also, um, certainly what we've seen based on the car wash operation experience in Brazil is that uh, these, this anti-corruption agenda can be used uh, as a kind of a new and, and particularly effective sort of soft power method for shaping political outcomes in countries. Um, you know, when it's used selectively to go after certain movements and certain politicians. Um, so, uh, those are some of the early indications of what to expect um, under Biden. Um, so a lot of reason for concern, I think. Um, and I mean, you know, it's, it's Biden, but it's really 
quite similar to what US policy has been in the region for over 140 years, uh, which has consisted in trying to ensure that the US um, is able to retain its political and economic hegemony in um, you know, the Latin American quote unquote backyard. Um, and so um, really uh, things, things have not changed a great deal and we're not seeing at this point much of a change um, uh, under the Biden administration. So I've gone on way too long, sorry about that. No worries, thank you. That was a full course, I think, in Latin American politics. So I appreciate that, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, we have gotten several questions uh, submitted already. We got some questions submitted before the webinar. So I, um, I'll just go ahead and um, jump into that next. Feel free. Um, to all of our participants, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A uh, little icon in the bottom of your screen um, and I'll put them on the list here. If we don't get to your questions, we'll try to follow up with, with you after because um, I see a lot of good ones already. We have about, uh, 50, about just under 15 minutes for this. Um, so that's a good amount of time. So I just wanted to start off with a, a comment um, that I think also goes along with this topic um, about what Biden is doing uh, in Latin America right now. And it's, I think it's a really important moment. Um, his comment was submitted by Charlie Hinton. And he says, as a reminder, this, the Biden State Department is supporting another year for Jovenel Moise in Haiti, although his term ended on um, at the beginning of February and right. massive demonstrations are calling him, uh, calling for him to leave. Do you right. have any comments on that, Alex? So the best person to ask is my colleague, Jake Johnston, who's been spending nearly 100% of his time on uh, Haiti recently. But um, from what I understand, uh, you know, there've been a lot of protests there uh, around Moise, you know, trying to overstay his time in office. Um, He's been a very, very unpopular president. People want him to go. Uh, I think at, at this stage, from, from what I understand, a lot of the grassroots movements um, would like to see him you know, replaced. Um, and, and I don't know the Haitian constitution well enough to know how this works and, and, and how feasible it is, but um, by someone like you know, the head of the Supreme Court of, of Haiti uh, until, until the elections occur. Um, you know, close to a year from now. And, you know, I think, you know, that's sort of seen as necessary because, you know, the, the, the country is, is in real disarray. And I think, you know, the movements kind of want to gather collectively and, and, and work out, try to work out the future of the country politically. And they need time to do that ahead of the next elections. So that's my impression, um, but my colleague Jake would be the best person to ask. You can reach them at johnston at cper.net. Um, so some really great questions here. Uh, I'm gonna try to quickly address them all. Um, the question about the role of China is very important because I see as a current sort of extension of the Monroe Doctrine is to now um, sort of put China in the place of, you know, what used to be the European imperial powers and used to be the Soviet Union now China is the big um, threat, uh, you know, from the perspective of the State Department, or you know, they want to have China perceived as such. Um, and I think part of that threat has to do with the fact that um, China uh, it doesn't impose. I mean, you know, there's a, certainly a lot of criticism out there that's I'm sure very legitimate around, you know, some some of the. Um, infrastructure programs and so on that China has been involved in and hydroelectric dams and all the rest. But one thing that China doesn't do contrary to the US is it does not attach uh, conditions to internal domestic policy to you know, any sort of support, um, which you know, the US very much does and also does through um, you know, its influence in the big international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, 
So China has, um, by becoming such an important trade partner, now the major trade partner for most South American countries uh, ahead of the US and a major investor, it's created the sort of space that has provided kind of more, more options, more um, created a greater space for, uh, I think, Latin American independence to grow. Um, it's, it's allowed them to diversify their relations more rather than you know, depending as much on the US and US investment and so on. Um, and again, I think that's why uh, a big part of the reason why China is seen as a threat and, um, and you have both the Trump administration now the Biden administration that have kind of given signals that they're gonna do everything they can to counter China's influence in the region. Um, I don't know how successful they can be because you know, basically all, all the Latin American governments at this point want to have good relations with China. Um, so there's a question about the Bolivian coup, that the problem is that the US, it's kind of a long question. It seems like the problem is that the US, not the OAS, which acts as a puppet. Yes, right. It seems that the letter requests by the members of the Progressive Caucus regarding the OAS and Luis Almagro on the Bolivian election will never be answered because the executive branch included the DOS, that including the, D the D Department of State doesn't want the OAS to do anything differently to make things change. Do you think our focus should be on Congress? I think yes. And in fact, I think Congress can continue to push. This isn't over yet. Um, and so um, I, I think this is to be continued. I don't think um, some of the people in Congress that have taken on the OAS on this point have given up yet. Um, and so I think it's gonna be coming up more. Uh, and then on the question of the PSUV receiving 61% of the vote, but 91% of the seats that, yeah, that's, it's a system that's kind of, it's, it's a, a both sort of nominal and proportional system that I don't fully understand, but that leads to, um, you know, very strong majorities, um, based on slimmer majorities and it's worked both ways. So in the 2000. 15 elections, um, the opposition, um, you know, got a similar score and ended up, they got even less, I, I believe, and, and also ended up with uh, a super majority, or maybe not a super majority because it's contested um, of, of the seats in, in the National Assembly. Uh, so it's a system that works both ways and that you see in other countries. Um, that is sort of designed to kind of ensure strong majorities so that you don't have, you know, very split, unstable uh, sort of legislatures. Um, but, you know, it certainly could warrant a lot of criticism. Um, okay, I think we already, uh, yeah, Charlie Hinton in Haiti, we discussed that. The labor federations and unions in Latin American politics, uh, in a lot of places, they're extremely weak. It's an extremely small percentage of workers um, that are unionized. I, I think Argentina is one of the countries that still has very strong unions and that play a big role in politics. Um, Brazil, that used to be more the case, it's less and less the case because unfortunately in the last few years and uh, under the Temer government in particular, uh, the unelected Temer government, um, they, they carried out some reforms that really broke the back of labor. And so it's much, much diminished. Um, hopefully that'll change, but that seems to be the situation at the moment in Brazil. Um, Biden, a message on the damage to poor citizens of US unilateral sanctions. Yeah, I think this is an important issue, that of sanctions. And I, I think we're seeing progress. In, in Congress, we're seeing progress um, in various areas, you know, the, the progressives and, you know, we can all have our criticisms of the progressives and how much they actually, you know, push for in terms of political, uh, a progressive agenda. But I think they have a bit more heft than they've had for a while. Um, and so when they can be pushed, they, they can do interesting things. And on, on the question of sanctions, we're seeing you know, a lot more questioning of US sanctions regimes coming from Congress. Um, and there was a recent letter, for instance, uh, led by um, Representative Omar and Senator Warren, um, basically uh, you know, kind of offering a critique to the sanctions regime and, and calling for a thorough review of sanctions. 
And last year you had Representative Omar who introduced the um, Congressional Oversight Over Sanctions Act to try to rein in this unilateral power that the president has to impose sanctions wherever he or she may you know, see fit, uh, you know, without any sort of control from Congress. Um, and so there's a, there's a strong movement now, I think probably a number of people here are aware of, of sort of the growing kind of mobilization among um, you know, movements in the country uh, to oppose sanctions and, and this is growing in Congress as well. Um, so yeah, we're seeing some, we're seeing some encouraging things there. Um, but the fact is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the sanctions that were put there by Trump are still in place now under Biden. And there is no indication as yet that they're doing anything to remove or, you know, at least, you know, partially roll back those sanctions. And um, there are a lot of questions here. I may not get to all of them. Yeah, Alex, there, um, there's one follow-up question um, yes. on the topic of sanctions um, and about the, the congressional letter that was just put out. Um, and the, the question specifically is, how do you think that we in the movement can best utilize this letter? How can we help build more support for it inside and outside of Congress? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the best way I think of utilizing the letter is to look at who signed it and to see those people as people that need to be pushed further, right? Um, and obviously other members of Congress need to be pushed further as well, but that's maybe a good place to start where you can say, look, we, we see that you're concerned about sanctions. Did you know this, you know, X, Y, and Z about sanctions? You know, give them more facts about the impact of sanctions, um, the incredible unpopularity of sanctions in Venezuela. Uh, you know, polling shows that sanctions are very, very unpopular. And so this leads also to a backlash against the US. So even from the point of view of US interests, the sanctions, you know, don't make sense. Uh, so, so I think, you know, advocating to those same members of Congress to do more. And, you know, there, there are going to be more pieces of legislation, more letters and so on coming out of Congress on sanctions, I think, uh, you know, relatively soon. And so, you know, there'll be things to do around that and things that people can do to generate, you know, more um, legislation and letters and so on from Congress, which, you know, can eventually have, have some impact. Um, yeah, thank you. Maybe one more question um, from this list here, and then we can move into our closing. Uh, would you like to pick a question? There's so many good ones. I well, I'll, I'll go to the last one. Uh, Michael Bass, who mentions that Merkley Leahy, Durbin, and other Senate colleagues recently introduced um, the Honduras Human Rights and Anti-Corruption Act of 2021. So I think that's, that's important to flag. Um, it's, uh, it, it basically mirrors uh, similar legislation in the House that a lot of groups have, have worked on and gotten a lot of members of Congress to sign on to uh, called the, um, uh, the, 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 the Berta, what is it called again? The Honduras Berta Caceres, um, human, the Berta Caceres Human Rights in Honduras Act. It's been introduced several times. It's going to be introduced again in this Congress very soon. Um, so now we're seeing what amounts to sort of a Senate companion to this legislation, which is really encouraging. It's always tougher to get strong pieces of legislation um, introduced in the Senate. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's something that's, you know, worth um, flagging uh, and supporting. And, and, it, and it serves kind of two, uh, two useful, it does two useful things. One, it deals with a horrific situation in Honduras, you know, um, suspending, uh, you know, security assistance, assistance to police and military in Honduras, which is really, it's essential component um, because of course the U.S. has been a strong supporter of Honduran security forces, uh, you know, since the dictatorship there. And, um, you know, the US, you know, uses a base in Honduras. And so there's this very strategic military relationship 
Um, and so it supported the military and police despite all the repression and human rights abuses and corruption that they've been involved in. And for the same reason as sort of upheld you know, a really atrocious government at this point, you know, we have the president of Honduras, Juan Orlando Hernandez, who is, um, you know, allegedly involved in all sorts of drug trafficking schemes. And yet the, the US continues to support him. Um, so it really highlights uh, kind of all that's wrong with US Central America policy. It's all, you know, the security focus and, you know, supporting right-wing repressive governments at all costs because it's seen as in the U.S. strategic interests. And, and this legislation goes against that. So I think it's very useful um, to have it and, and, you know, to try to get it to move forward. Yes, one of the many tools that we will have. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, Thank you so much for your presentation and for your energy for these lots, uh, lots of amazing questions that came in. Thank you for everybody that submitted a question or made a and comment. I'm sorry I didn't answer all the questions, but you know maybe we can follow up afterwards. My email is um, main at cepr.net and feel free to shoot me questions or comments or you know whatever whatever you like. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, and we'll be sending a follow up email after this, and I'll include that in the follow up email. Right now, I want to turn the we webinar over to Ni Nino Pagricio, and he's going to close us out tonight. Are you there, Nino? I'm here. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, wow, Alex, you give us a whirlwind trip around uh, mostly Latin America and other countries as well. So uh, thank you so much for providing uh, uh, a broad perspective and analysis on the recent election scenario in uh, Latin America and the political struggles that are going on to reject the neoliberal policies. It is perhaps interesting uh, to observe that um, three of the five countries you uh, uh, mentioned uh, seem to represent three different stages of resistance, I would say, to uh, neoliberalism. Uh, three geopolitical snapshots, if you will. So we have Venezuela that has been resisting the longest with uh, 25 or 26 democratic elections in the last 21 years of the uh, Bolivarian project and still going strong politically speaking. Then we have Bolivia that has been able to regain its victory, as you uh, pointed out, to self-determination after repudiating the uh, right-wing policies of uh, neoliberalism in the last elections. And Ecuador, where we can see daily the fierce clash um, uh, with the powerful neoliberal forces trying to maintain an election that was hijacked uh, by Lenin Moreno. As we get closer to elections in Chile and Peru, as you refer to as well, perhaps we will see more uh, such clashes uh, happening. So we are not only talking about US, Canada, we include Canada in that, and EU and European Union interventions. Uh, we see interference of supernatural organizations like the OAS, and you mentioned this, you refer to that very clearly, very specifically, that is breaking its own charter mandate on uh, about uh, no interference. So in my opinion, what uh, your analysis makes evident is how overt these clashes have become. Um, I would say how shameless, in fact, and that democracy itself uh, can easily be trampled upon despite the rhetoric of its defense and despite the call to elections, uh, that need um, the neoliberal rubber stamp to be acceptable or else 
they pull out sanctions as a punitive uh, weapon. Never mind that sanctions are illegal and um, criminal. So as an activist, we need to ask the questions, what is the meaning of democracy when it comes to confronting neoliberalism? And also, how can we defend democracy as the true expression of the will of the people? And finally, I would like to mention what is the takeaway uh, from your presentation. Now, I cannot speak and I will not claim to speak for everyone in the audience, but for me, the most important takeaway, particularly as a Latin American, is that there is a, a growing political consciousness developing in the region, and we must welcome that. Following the US domination for most of the 20th century, with some exceptions, you know, most notably the uh, Cuban Revolution, the 21st century is witnessing an awakening that reminds me of the popular movements of the 19th century uh, successfully fighting back the colonial power of Spain. The US eventually came to replace Spain. But today I am optimistic and I look forward to uh, a truly independent Patria Grande as Bolivar and Hugo Chavez envisioned. So again, Alex, on behalf of all our sponsors, uh, thank you for sharing your analysis uh, today. We will follow up on you and uh, on uh, what you write and publish. Uh, thanks, Ellen and Roger in the background there. And thanks to the audience uh, for joining us. So I will say, Goodbye until next one in solidarity.